Good evening. How's everybody? Are y'all ready to get into this word? This word is life changing. Uh, I wouldn't just get up here and say that if I didn't know. I know because it's happened to me and I've seen it happen to many, 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 many others. And I imagine you could get up here and, and, and say the same. Amen. Well, open, if you would, to Proverbs 16, and we'll be there shortly. Um, but before we do, I always do this. I get you to start turning, and then I say, let's pray. So <laughs> let's pray before you turn. Father, thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for hungry sheep. It is a blessing to, for me as, as, as a preacher just to know that people show up because they're hungry for your word. God, as you, as daddy, I can't imagine how you feel when people want to spend time with you. I know how I feel when my children want to spend time with me, Lord. So thank you. I thank you for hungry sheep. Lord, I pray for the families that are represented here. God, I pray that you would show them how much you love them. God, I pray you would destroy their yokes. Lord, that you would take their burdens just like you say you always do, Lord. Let us not be hard-headed and stubborn and not bring our burdens to you. God, those that are represented here, Lord, I pray that their family as a whole would start coming back together. God, that you'd start restoring these families in here. Lord, for the sole purpose of being together and giving you the glory. Because when it's all said and done, God, we want to lift you up higher and higher. Lord, we want to do what you've called us to do. Lord, we do want your kingdom on this earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord, thank you that we can meet again tonight in the air condition without people persecuting us, Lord. Lord, again, we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. 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 All right, so, man, I labored over this message, y'all. I just, I just, there's so much there and like, I just trust the Lord that, that I laid it out how he wants me to, to preach it and to teach it. I mean, it's, 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 it's heavy, so we're wrapping up our series that we started, you know, four weeks ago. I've been calling it the Pride of Kings. I told you that this message come by way of studying for another message, and I run into these four kings, and I start studying about these four kings, and man, it just turned into this big thing, and as you know, here we are four weeks later, but the pride of kings. Now, up to this point, we have seen the pride in Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he was seduced into thinking that he was the man. Any of us ever felt like that? You were seduced to thinking that you were higher than you ought to think? And remember the story that God took him, he humbled him, he put him out in the pasture, people were throwing him square bales of hay, <laughs> his hair looked like eagle's feathers, his claws looked like those of a buzzard, his, 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 he looked like an ox, he grazed like an ox until one day he realized it wasn't about him and he humbled himself before the Lord, but God had to humble him. Amen. Then we saw Belshazzar who was so stubborn. He took the things of God from God's temple and he used them for his own whatever he wanted to do. And then God made that hand come up on the, the side of the wall and begin to write. And what he was writing, God was prophesying what's going to happen later, that he was weighed, he was measured, and he was divided. And because he did not humble himself before God... He died. God tried to humble him. He was stubborn, didn't listen. And what happened to him? He died. Now, last week, we looked at Darius, King Darius the Mede, and he was deceived by the people 
They made that decree. It says, hey, we're going to bow down to you, Darius, nobody else. Daniel would not do it, so therefore he threw Daniel in the lion's den. And what happened? Those hungry lions, those mouths were shut up. It was a great miracle because when, once they got him out, they threw the other guys in. And before it says, before they even hit the ground, the women and the children, they were eaten by the lions before they even hit the ground. So it wasn't that the lions wasn't hungry. It was God showed up. That's what it was. So Darius turned his heart after he saw that, and he says, I'm serving the one true God. So we saw his pride, but we saw him become humbled. So tonight, we're going to see our last king, and his name is Cyrus. Now, he's the one that's going to reverse the curse of pride that's been over these previous three kings. So these were the four kings that were over Israel, when they were in exile, when they were in captivity for 70 years, that were these four kings right here. So you got the three, and then now you have Cyrus is who we're going to look at tonight. Now, a really cool fact to begin with about Daniel and these four kings is God used Daniel to minister to all four of them. That's really cool. But when I was thinking about this, my heart kind of goes out to Daniel because if you ask anyone who counsels or tries to minister to prideful people, it's the hardest thing that you'll ever do in your life because they're stubborn and they're deceived. They think of themselves more than they are. They think that they know it all. They think... And you can't even get a word in edgewise. They're, they're not going to normally take counsel. And that's when God has to step in and humble them. But guys, you'll see this. It's smarter to humble yourselves before God has to humble you. Amen. And we'll see that more uh, tonight as we get into this, this scripture. But through the first three kings, or two, at least two of the first three, we do see the good news is if you're a prideful person, it can be reversed. So here's what I want to do tonight. I want to kind of do this in the, in the form of some points. We're going to, I'm going to have three points or three reasons tonight that God wants to reverse pride in our life. He, 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 if we have any pride in our life, he wants to reverse it. I mean, we can have a little dose and we can have a big dose, God doesn't want any dose. And you'll see this by the time we, we, we close. And, 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 and I'm going to really, by the end of this message, I'm really going to try to encourage you at the end uh, of this thing. So here's number one. The number one uh, reason that God wants us to, 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 to reverse our pride in our life is real simple. Because he loves us. <clears throat> Seriously. We are his children. We are to represent, we are to represent him and how can we represent him when God is not prideful? Amen. Think about it. How can we represent God correctly when God is not prideful and we are? Okay? So a prideful person, though, can become a humble person. But We just saw it in Nebuchadnezzar and we saw it in Darius. But again, God had to humble them before they humbled themselves. And, and, and that's the tough part. It, 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 it should not take God showing us how big he is and showing us how small we are. That is something that by faith we need to understand. We, we, we should have already seen that in our life, how big God is and just how fragile we are. I mean, that ought to humble us right off the bat right there. But the, here's the question that it raises, though. Why would God even take the time to even humble us. Why, why would he do that? And I, and I want to show you that. I want to answer this question for you. Proverbs 16, verse 18. We've read this before in this series, but I want to look at it again. Now, you've heard people say pride goes before the fall. Pride goes before the fall. Pride goes before the fall. That's not really what it says. It says pride goes before, somebody help me. Destruction. Now, it does go on to say a haughty spirit goes before the fall. Okay, you could say somebody who is destroyed is falling. I mean, I understand that. But, but that word destruction is, 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 is what's so powerful. Okay, because the devil comes to... 
what was that last one? Destroy, destroy right? So that, w when you think about the devil wanting to destroy your family, to destroy your ministry, to destroy your testimony, th th that, that can happen through pride. Okay, the devil, the devil is a prideful being. It's what got him kicked out of heaven. Okay, he, he was prideful as he led worship. He was trying to receive the worship. Thank y'all. Thank y'all angels for praising me. And that's not even what was happening. You're supposed to take and point. Take and point. Cody, when she's up here, and Daryl and the rest of the guys, they're, 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 they're playing for the Lord. And they're saying, here, look at the cross. Here, look at the cross. Here, look at the cross. They're a vessel. They're a pipe to, to point us. They're a scope that points us to the cross. But see, Satan was wanting to receive, receive, receive. So the very first opportunity he had when he hit this earth, he got face to face with Adam and Eve. And he said, Adam, Eve, look at that apple on that tree. Doesn't it look so good? And she said, we can't eat that. He says, oh, God's holding out on you. He knows when you eat it, you're going to be like God. Okay. Oh, I want to be like God. So, right? They were destroyed. Sin entered the world. They were destroyed. They were destroyed. And then that's, that's when sin came into the world. Now, what did he do with Jesus? He tried to do the same thing with Jesus in the wilderness, but it didn't work with Jesus because Jesus is humble, and he just quoted scripture on him, you know? Now, he was successful in these kings, and one of them he actually killed. But here's my original question. Why does God humble us? I'm going to put it on the screen. God humbles people to keep them from being destroyed. Because he loves us. You see the first point? Write that down in your notes if you're taking notes. God humbles people because he doesn't want you to be destroyed. He doesn't want to see you fall. He doesn't want to see you picking up the pieces. Amen? Amen. Now, here's the next reason. I hope y'all got that. He cares for you. He loves you. If he wouldn't, he wouldn't have created you. He didn't just create you for, for just a pawn. You know what I mean? He created you you're fearfully, isn't that what it said? You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, here's number two. Next reason. Next reason God wants to reverse pride in our life. God has plans for our good and his glory. Now, that's a, that's a fancy kind of a way to say it. Here's a, here's a way you can say it. He got some good stuff he wants to do. <laughs> and he wants to use us to do it. Let's just say it like that. God has some good stuff that he wants to do in our life, and he wants to use us. Yeah. He has some good stuff that he wanted to do in your life today. Did he get to do it? Yep. He gets good. That's good. But how many times do we miss it? Okay. How many times do we miss it? Now, let me just give you, some, give you some stuff here. Look what God said to Israel when they were in the wilderness. Miss, don't, why don't you miss this? I'll put it on the screen. Deuteronomy 8, verse 16. It says, it says that God fed you in the wilderness with manna. I don't know if I've told you this, but manna in Hebrew means what? <laughs> really? You look it up. It means what? I mean, don't you imagine when they saw it falling? What? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And it hit the ground, looked like a chicken leg. I don't know. <laughs> I see manna as chicken leg. <laughs> what? what? You know, it, it, it's really cool. But notice, notice the point. It says, God fed you with manna, which your fathers didn't know. Their mom and daddy didn't know anything. Their, their ancestors didn't know anything about manna. God never did this. Right. But why did he do it, though? That he might humble you test you what does it say church to do good in the end okay what does this mean well they're out there in the wilderness they ain't eating a thing yeah. there's a few scriptures before this talked about the rock and the water coming out of the rock yeah. okay okay same kind of same kind of deal now he's actually feeding them he's feeding them and he had specifications he says listen he says 
this man is for today. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, this month, this, this man is for that day. Now, on this day, you gather two times for the next day because we rest on the next day. Okay? Now, if you try to load up and do extra for tomorrow, he says, no, don't do that. Trust me for tomorrow. Church, you do know that's for us too. He said, trust me for tomorrow. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. It's got enough for itself already. Don't worry. Don't I feed the birds? Don't they have a place to live? Aren't they lesser than you? Aren't you greater than them? You, you see what I'm saying? So, so here's what he's saying. Here's what he's trying to teach you. I'm the one that provides. Amen. Guys, that humbles you when you realize that, hey, I don't have anything left. The, the, there's, there's, there's more bills left at the end of the month than money. I, there's nothing, in, there's nothing in, the, in the refrigerator. There's nothing in the pantry. What am I going to do? And God shows up and he provides. That's humbling. Somebody you, run, somebody you run into or somebody gives you a call about doing a job or whatever and God provides at the last second and, and boom. And that humbles you because you realize, man, I've done everything I can and I didn't get anything done. But man, God shows up and looks what he does. Yeah. So, so that's what he does right there, that, that he might humble you. It's very humbling to, to, to see God provide. If, if you've ever had somebody walk up and bless you when you were at the end of your rope and you didn't have anything left and they bless you, that is so humbling. Yeah. Yeah. And then it says that that, that, that tests you too. That, that tests you. You, you, you just, it doesn't notice only, it tests your faith. Next time you get in this situation, are you going to lose it? Are you going to act crazy? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Or are you just going to trust God? Because he just said he does all this, does all this to show you good in the end. So guys, it's a very good thing to trust in the Lord. Right? Okay, Uh, uh, what is it? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He wants us to be a Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 person. To trust in the Lord with all our heart. Not leaning on our own understanding. But in all our ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. He'll make our path straight. Did you get that? Okay, because see, some of us really struggle with that. I wonder what you're leaning on right now. Are you leaning on what you got stored up for, for retirement? Is that what you're leaning on? Because that, that, that ain't what you should be leaning on. The only security is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Trust in him with all, A-double-L, all your heart. Lean not on your own thing, your own way. See, that's pride. I can do it. Don't need you, God on this one. Don't ever say, God, I don't need you on this one. Don't ever think you're bothering him. He's a big God. You're not bothering God. He's a big God. He says, come to me. Come to me. Lean not on our understanding. He says, in all your ways. That means in whatever you're doing that, that's according to his will and according to his glory, if you acknowledge him in that, he makes your way straight. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Same thing with Romans 8, 28. I mean, we quote that one all the time. All things work together for good for those who love God and are, cord- and are called according to his purpose. No matter if you've made bad decisions and you're, you're still wanting to honor God in your life, even though you're going through disciplinary times, not punishment, okay? God disciplines us because he loves us. He's not going to punish you. Punishment fell on Jesus. I've been saying that for a few weeks now. The punishment of our sin has already fell on Jesus. The discipline that we get from the Lord is for our good. Okay? It's for our good. He disciplines those that he loves okay so our point that we're talking about here is he wants us to reverse pride for good for our good for our good right so when the children of israel we're we're back to daniel here in in our study in daniel when they were in exile when they were in captivity to babylon and these kings when you look at what they're going through can you say that that's going to be for good Yeah, yeah, okay, they're getting disciplined because God said, hey, you got to let the land rest every seven years. They didn't do it, 
Okay, they went 490 years without letting the land rest, and that adds up to 70 years, and they were in 70 years of exile. God <laughs> means what he says. So he, they're getting disciplined for 70 years, but at the end of that, it's going to be for good. Okay? It's still for the good. It's just like you tearing your child's tail up. It's for their good. You don't want them running out in traffic. You don't want them eating too many sweets. You don't want them back talking. Because if they back talk you, they're going to back talk their boss and they're going to get fired. You see what I'm saying? Now, let's zero in on Israel a little bit here. Does this mean that God put them in captivity for their good? Well, let's turn to Jeremiah 24. Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Now, I'm getting to Cyrus. Y'all don't think I done got on another message. <laughs> look, at, look at Jeremiah 24, verse 5. Now, this is Jeremiah. He's a prophet, and he is prophesying. It ain't happened. It's 100 plus years before any of this has happened, okay? This ought to blow you away. Who knows something before it happens? Yeah. Only God, okay? And he can speak it to a man, which he did here in Jeremiah. He says, thus says the Lord, verse 5, the God of Israel, like these good figs. Oh, man, let me just pause right here. <laughs> Wes had come in there and brought me some fig preserves early earlier to put on my biscuits and I almost kissed him. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm telling you, I've, I've been, I, yeah. Anyway, I, they, yeah, anyway, I don't want to get off on that. <laughs> so like these good figs, amen, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah whom I have sent out of this place, watch this, for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans, that's Babylon. If you really want to trace it back, remember Abraham left. God told him to leave his country, get up out of there, and go to the land that I showed you. Remember that? Guess who he left? Chaldeans. Chaldeans turned into Babylon. They mixed with the Tower of Babel people. This is where Babylon comes from, Babylon. People who talk a lot, Babylon. <laughs> but anyway, you remember though God changed their language and yeah, okay. Anyway, so so okay, we just said it was Israel in captivity for good. Well, Jeremiah just said he's mirroring the Lord. He said they're there for their own good. Now, has anybody go to uh, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven? Has anybody ever quoted Jeremiah twenty nine eleven? Have you have you ever had it? Uh, up in your house, maybe a plaque or, or, or something on the wall. It, it's, a, it's a great verse. It's a, it's a beautiful reminder of what God is doing in our life and what he was doing in their life. But have you ever read it in context? Let's, let's read it in context. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of, it can say good here, but it says peace here in the, in the New King James. Thoughts of peace not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And everybody said, hallelujah. That is his thoughts towards us, guys. Peace, hope. He wants, to, he wants us to, he wants good. But listen, right here he's speaking to a people, Israel, who is in captivity. Think about it. This is a prophecy to those who are captured. So they're hearing this. But are they taking it in and believing it? Now look at verse 10. The one proceeding. For thus says the Lord, after the 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You read it like that, Amen. that's awesome. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. Okay, remember, Jeremiah is prophesying that they would be in captivity for 70 years. 
If you were to go read Daniel 9 verse 2, Daniel studied the books of Jeremiah so Daniel knew exactly how many years they would be in captivity. That's some good stuff. The Bible's amazing. The Bible's amazing. So, you see it? What's his plans for them? Good. Okay. Now, let's go to 2 Chronicles. Go back to your left. Are y'all with me? This is one of those messages, if you don't lean in and you're not a fan of the Scripture, you, you could let your day overtake what God's wanting to speak to you about and you will miss, you will miss uh, what He's wanting to say to you. So, in my own sweet way, I'm going to say, pay attention. <laughs> God's wanting to talk to you right now. I know you're tired. I know some of you had tough days, but man, God's really wanting to speak to you. It, the Bible is amazing. You see men speak to, to prophecy, they weren't even there. Yep. That's really cool. Really cool. Only God. Now, enter Cyrus. We're going to see Cyrus right here. Okay? I want to show you how the prophecy of Jeremiah was fulfilled, and we see it in, in Cyrus right here. What did it say? At the, Jeremiah 29, 10, and 11, it said that there's, after their 70 years, they were going to be set free, going back to Jerusalem and all that good stuff, right? Okay, we see that. Now, do you want to see it fulfilled? Okay. Yep. All right, here we go. Second Chronicles 36, and he's fulfilling it through this King Cyrus which is one that took over for Darius. All right, ready? Verse 22. Now, actually, these are the last words, Hebrew-wise, in the Old Testament. You do realize your Bible's not laid out chronologically. Okay, this is really, if you study it, this is known to be the last Hebrew script. This is the last thing said before the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, watch this. In Hebrew, in Hebrew. Okay, ready? Verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Didn't we just read Jeremiah? The Lord stirred up the spirit of who? Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. Stop right there. This is way different from the other guys. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? He's walking around the top of his porches and things. He goes, look what I've made. Look what I made. Didn't he? Belshazzar. Throwing a party with thousands and thousands of people. Look at what I've done. Darius, bow down to me. Look who I am. I'm a God. Cyrus says this. All the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. He acknowledged that God has given it to him. And he has commanded me to, watch, build him Build God a house, a temple where? At Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Okay, here's what this is meaning. It means the 70 years are over. I, Cyrus, am going to resource the rebuilding of the temple, and you guys, when it's done, go up. You're free. Do you see the reversal of pride? The other guys, pride, pride, pride. Cyrus, he's giving God the glory. This is is so good. And and guys, here's why I'm showing you Cyrus right here in 2 Chronicles. Okay? Uh, Daniel... The first six books of Daniel, which we've studied up to this point, the first six books are all about the exile, okay? It's about these kings. It's about them being in exile. When you get to chapter 7, 
then you get into the visions that Daniel has. And, and you've seen this when we was in our Revelation study. When we went by verse by verse, verse by verse in Revelation. I think that's still online, by the way. Okay, we saw where Daniel, a lot of his visions was pertaining to the end times. Okay? And a lot of it had to do with Jesus and when the Messiah would show up. The skeptics are blown away how precise Daniel was in his prophecy. Well, he can be precise when God's speaking through it. Okay? And, and then you see Cyrus, you know, in here and there, and you'd have to pick it up. The best way to look at Cyrus is through, the, through, through Chronicles and Isaiah because it, it, it shows it out a whole lot better. And that's why I'm using it like this. So I just want to show you there in verse 22 and verse 23 that God called Cyrus to do great things for his people. A so-called pagan king changed his mind. He, he went before him and used him in mighty ways. You got to read about Cyrus. You, you go read about Cyrus. It, 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 it'll, it'll blow your mind. And Cyrus, he funded the whole thing. Isn't it amazing how... When you fall in God's will, God will prepare the way. Amen. Amen. Hmm? Now, let me encourage you. Some of us in here may have made horrible decisions. Horrible decisions. And right now, you feel like you're being disciplined by God. Okay? He's still working for your good. Amen. We just saw it right here with Israel. If you need another example, let me give you another example. Let me give you, everybody know Joseph? Yeah. Everybody knows Joseph? Okay, he's a good example. God allowed him to be put in a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery. Then he went to the big house and went in prison. Okay, a couple of times. All right, he done lost two coats out of the deal. He lost one with his brothers. They tore it and act like a wild animal got it. And then he lost the coat when that, when that queen tried to get a hold of him. He just come out that coat, let, let you have it, right? But he got put in prison, okay? So you would think Daniel, uh, Joseph, a good boy, here he is. God's allowed him to be put in a pit and allowed him to be put into prison twice and sold into slavery, okay? Well, what did he do wrong? Let, let me show you what I think he did. Can I do that? Man, God, I believe God showed me this. Okay, let me, let me just show you what I believe God showed me. I believe he had pride in him. Okay, can I show you? He's just 17 years old. He's just 17 years old. And, and I believe God addressed the pride in the pit and in the prison because he fixed to put him second in command in Egypt. So you got to be ready to be second in command in Egypt because here's what he's going to happen. Israel's going to need to be saved out of the famine. And if he wasn't a good administrator with the food, Israel would have died right there because of the famine. And God used him in a mighty way in Egypt. But here's 17-year-old Joseph. Okay? You remember the story. Okay? Here's why. Let me explain my thinking here. He's 17 years old, right? God gives him a dream. He gives him a dream that his brothers are going to bow down to him. Okay? Let's, let's, read, let's read two verses on the screen. Okay, Genesis 37, verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, remember, he, his father showed a lot of favoritism towards this boy. So obviously, they hated him. <laughs> they really did. Remember, he got the coat of, of many colors. Yeah. He's flaunting around, you know. Uh, so they didn't speak peaceably with him at all. Are y'all following me? Yeah. Verse 5. Now, Joseph had a dream, <laughs> and he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. Okay, here's my thinking. You ready? <laughs> what would cause a younger brother to go to his older, stronger brothers and say, y'all going to bow down to me? Or stupidity. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Yeah. It, I, do, do, so you see where I think, I, I truly believe God showed me that. I truly believe that he had some pride in his heart. So God humbled him through the pit into the prison to remove that mess so he could be number two in command. Y'all see that? Yeah. You ever thought about it like that? So that was number two. God wants to reverse the pride because he's got some good stuff he wants to show us and do through us. Man, I hope y'all getting this. 
Okay, here's number, here's number three, last one. And, and I hope you don't think this point's cheesy, but it's powerful. And, and it's this, God knows us before we ever know him, known him, knew him. I mean, did I word that right? I mean, think about it. He's the creator. We're the creation. Remember what he said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 5? He says, Before I formed you, I knew you. Every single one of us are a dream come true. Because before he formed us, I believe we're all like Jeremiah. Before he formed us, he knew us. Okay? <laughs> So, so it ain't like we were out one day or went to church one day and say, Oh, hey, God, I'm Scotty. I'm God. You know, it, it wasn't a meeting like that. The very moment that we started breathing and going, Wah, 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 yeah. he couldn't wait till the day that we said, Jesus, Amen. be my Lord, be my Savior. He couldn't wait till that day. He's yearning for that day. And guys, he's patient for that day with a lot of us. Because how many times have you been in a church service or somewhere and the Lord's saying, it's time, it's time, you see who I am. You see who I am. Go ahead and put your pride aside. You can't do it yourself. Go ahead and put yourself, go ahead and, go ahead and walk that aisle or go ahead and make this decision. Go ahead and shake that preacher's hand. Whatever he's calling you to do, kneel by that pine tree, whatever it may be. He can't wait for that. But a lot of his pride holds that decision back or being scared or being fearful or think we got to give something up. Man, you ain't giving anything up. You're gaining everything that means something. Everything. Ask Chris. Ask Chris. We talked about it today. How what his old life looks like and what he has now. He has joy. He has peace. He is, has his family together, man. And they're doing this thing together now. Hallelujah. Amen. What was I saying? <laughs> we got off on something. Anyway, he knows us. Yeah, he knows us. He knows us before we know him. Now, let's look at this point by being known and how it pertains to Cyrus. I hope y'all think this is cool. I'm, I'm going to show you some scripture out of Isaiah, but then I'm, I'm going to show you the history of his life, and I, and I want to show you the, 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 how it comes together. Okay? Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 44. By the way, Ezra wrote Second and First Chronicles, by the way. Ezra. You ever heard of Ezra? Mm-hmm. Prophet. Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, verse 28. This, it kind of reads in, 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 in uh, one right after the other here. We'll go Isaiah 28, and then we'll go right into 40, Isaiah 45 and read a few verses in Isaiah 45. I'm waiting until I don't hear flipping. <laughs> okay. Isaiah 44, 28. Who says of who? Cyrus. He is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. Okay. Don't forget that. He's my what? Shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Remember? We just looked at that. Verse 40, uh, chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. Oh, man. D- did you see that? He stirred up Cyrus' spirit. He anointed him. What does anointed mean? We just studied it. It means to smear on, to rub on, to stain. Jesus has stained Cyrus for his glory and for his work. Do you see that? And that's what he wants to do to you and I. He wants to stain us to make us look more like him so we do his will. Okay. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. Oh, man. Don't get jealous. He's holding your hand too. Watch this. To subdue nations before him. Man, he was was a mighty king. And loose the armor of kings. 
to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break pieces in the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. In other words, ain't nothing going to stop you, brother, because I'm with you. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden uh, riches of secret places that you may know that the Lord who called you by your name, I am the God of Israel. Okay? Who call you by your name. Watch verse 4. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect. Okay? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. The nation, 12 tribes of Israel, come out of Jacob. Okay? But that's where Israel come from. Started in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's three generations. Jacob is Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect. So he's actually talking about Jacob, the one that he chose, his servant. And when he says Israel, he's speaking of the children that come out of Jacob, the, the, the 12 tribes. Right? right? Yeah. I have called you by your name. Watch what he says to Cyrus. I have named you. Though you have not known me, I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. In other words, he tooled him up. He weaponed him up. He girded him. Yeah. And he'll do the same for you. Yeah. Okay, here's what I wanted to bring out. Those two things. I wanted to show you those two things. He was a shepherd, and I have named you. Okay, now, can I give you some history? And, and, and I want to show you how cool this comes together. Now, let me say again, this is history. This is not from the Bible. Take history as it is. But these historians that I've looked up under his story it seems to be very credible. But again, I want to say it's history. It's somebody's writings of what, what happened. Okay? But I want to show you how, why I think this history is accurate because it lines up with God's Word. I don't really put a whole lot of emphasis in things unless it lines up with God's Word because in the end, that's the only thing that's going to stand. Okay, but let me just tell you. Okay, what did we say? Shepherd, and I have named you. Okay, here we go. Cyrus, he was born when his grandpa was king. Now try to follow me on this. He was born when his, when his papa was king. Okay, now his... Papa, Grandpa, had a dream that his grandson would overthrow him. All right? Now, his daddy, okay, Grandpa was king. The daddy was named Cannabis I. So, therefore, Cyrus, even though is named Cannabis II. All right? But just want to tell you that. So, here's what he's dreaming. Now, he's still a baby. Cannabis II was going to overthrow the grandpa. You with me? Yep. All right. So he tells the servant, take the baby, Cannabis II, who is later Cyrus, take him out and kill him. Because I've dreamed he's going to overthrow me, and I don't want that to happen. Now, it'd be different if, it, if, I, if I would pass it down to him, but I don't want him overthrowing me. So take the baby out and kill him. So he, this is history. He takes the baby out. And when he's going to take the baby out, to do something harmful to it, which this servant is struggling with this, I can promise you because of what happens. He runs into a shepherd family, man and woman, who is burying their stillborn baby. He says, hey guys, I know this is weird. Let me give you this baby that's alive and let me have the baby you guys are burying. Same age. So he gives Cannabis the second to the shepherds, takes the dead baby back, takes it to the king, king, here's the baby, I did what you told me, he's dead and they buried him. Follow me? The shepherds, beautiful family, raised the boy, 10 years with the boy. Guess what they named him? Cyrus, okay? Named him Cyrus, 10 years with the baby boy, all right? The king, Every year on the little boy's, baby boy's birthday, thought he was dead. He lamented so bad that his health got bad. Like, he, he was so torn up about what he had done to his grandson that on the 10th year, 
The servant finally turned to him and says, King, I didn't do it. Uh, that baby's still alive. The king rejoices. Uh, remember, Cyrus thinks that's his mom and daddy. He had no idea he was cannabis the second or whatever. So they went and got him, brought him back. You'd have to go read all history. Kind of, They restored everything. Everything was good. He didn't try to kill him anymore. But guess what happened? Cyrus overthrew his grandpa. <laughs> But guys, here's what's so cool. We just read it in Isaiah 44 and 45 when he says in the scripture. And let me tell you something. Daniel could have easily taken the scroll of Isaiah and the scroll of Jeremiah and taken it to Cyrus and says, look what scripture says about you. You do realize that, right? Because this was written way before. He could have taken it and says, look what scripture says. It says that he is my shepherd. He was just raised by shepherds. How else would the king's child be a shepherd? You see what I'm saying? Listen, if he's going to be a great leader, he needs to understand what it means to be a shepherd and how to shepherd sheep, how to watch sheep. He's my shepherd. But notice what he said in verse 45. He says, I'm the one that named you. You're supposed to be cannabis the second. I named you Cyrus. Oh, that's good. That's good. So here's what I'm saying to you. Can you see God's protection on that boy's life? You see how he learned to shepherd so he could lead? Here's what I tell you by, t by telling you this whole story. I hope I didn't bore you with it. Our God is a planner. You need to know this in our life. Our God is a planner. And he knows the plans that he has for us. Yes. Guys, we just got to walk in it. Yes. He knew us before we knowed him. And we need to walk in it. So guys, here's the bottom line. God humbles us in different ways. God humbles us in different ways. But ultimately, guys, here's the thing. We need to humble ourselves. Yeah. We need to humble ourselves. Okay? Uh... Let me ask you this question. Would you rather God humble you or you humble yourself? Right? This may be an encouragement to some right now. So let me encourage you with, with, with the time we got left. We all, most of us know this scripture. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says this, but I want you to, I want you to see the way it says it. He says, if my people... If my people who are called by my name, that if they will humble themselves and what? Pray. Stop right there. Uh, I think I wanted to put this on the screen. Yeah, I did. Think of what it said. Humble yourself. Then what? Does it sound like to you that we need to humble ourselves before we even pray? If we come to God with pride, he may hear you, but he ain't listening. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Amen. Did you get that? Yeah. He said, if we humble ourselves, pray. What else? Seek my face. Turn from my wicked ways. Yeah. Then I will hear from heaven. What will he do? Forgive their sin and heal their land. See, that's what he was saying to them when they were in exile. That's what he's saying to the United States of America right now, too. That's what he's saying to every one of us individually. If you will humble yourself, you better humble yourself before you pray. You remember what he says? It says, if you will come worship God, go make it right with your brother before you come back and worship. And then what Jesus says? If you got something against you, between you and somebody else, go make that right. That's more important before you come talk to me. Because let's get the sin out of the way, then come talk to me. Humble yourself. Seek his face. Turn from your wicked, wicked ways. I'll heal you. So, humility needs to take place before we pray. James 4, verses 9 and 10. Man, this is a tough one. He says we need to lament. That means cry. We need to mourn and we need to weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. 
Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Then he'll lift you up. Amen. You've got to be broken for your sin first. You may be praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. You don't see anything. If you you got to become broken for your sin first. Hope you see that. I mean, he, he'd rather us shut her down, shut all the lights off, shut all the fancy stuff off, shut all the microphones off, and be broken for our sin before we worship him. So, here's a big question. How do we humble ourselves? If we don't want God humbling us, how do we humble ourselves? You ready? I'm almost finished. It's real simple. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's so heavy. Okay, you ready? Turn to Philippians chapter 2. What's the question? How do we humble ourselves? Why don't we look to the one who humbled himself? Who is the starter and the finisher of this thing that we call faith? Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with equal to God. Well, it's because he's God. But made himself of no reputation. Okay, this is God with the greatest reputation of all. He could have a business card that never stops. <laughs> That's funny right there. You know what I mean? Like it never stops because his job description, it never stops. Okay, he become of no reputation. I mean, he stepped onto this earth, and what does it say? He took on the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of a man. Okay, so God divine humbled himself when he came to the earth. Then he humbled himself again when he become a man. You get that? Two humbles here. Humbled himself to even step on this earth and wrap himself in flesh. Again, he's born in a stall that's supposed to be for a sheep. He wasn't born in a castle. Remember, I told told you last week, he didn't own anything but a pair of sandals and his clothes on his back. That's all he had. That's all he had. You talk about humility. It's Jesus. God steps out of heaven to this earth. No, No reputation. Then once he gets here, he takes on the form of a servant when he gets here. He had no business card. You know what I'm saying? Verse 8, being found in the appearance of a man, humbled himself. Then it came to the cross. The worst way to die, the hardest beating a human could ever take was being beat with a cat of nine tails. He humbled himself to that point. Point. So when you say, how do I humble myself? You look at Jesus. Okay? I'm going to put this on the screen. Uh, I, please, please don't check out on me. I'm almost finished. Humble humility means this. To rank yourself below others. In a world that is screaming equality. And guys, I'm all about, you know, there's no one better than anybody else. Race, male, female, we all put our britches on the same way. Okay? I'm, 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 I'm all about that. But, but what, look, at, look at Philippians 2 verse 3 though. Are y'all still with me? Yeah. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem or consider others help me 
What's the, what's the key word? Better. Better. Oh, man, that hurts, doesn't it? Aren't we trying to work, 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 and be, be somebody, make something out of ourselves? Right? Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it what we've always been taught? Yeah. yeah? What did Jesus do? He's God, and he ranked himself below others. And he's sitting here telling us to rank ourselves below others. I want to put this on the screen, okay? Even though equality is great, and I understand the concept about equality, but humility is better than equality because in humility, we will consider others better than ourselves. Oh, man, that's hard. Somebody be real. Who does that sound like, though? Who, who does that sound like? Somebody will make themselves, make others better than him? Who does that sound like? Just like Jesus. Matthew 23, verse 11 says this, The greatest among you is the servant. Man, I always think of my grandma when I read that. I mean, she's already raised her kids. But she drove down to Pine Bluff, Arkansas and pulled me out of an abusive home to come live with her. They didn't have anything. Definitely didn't get any money from either side. And her and my papa <laughs> took me in. They didn't have to. I remember when my mom would come to town and, and, and they were sending me to school. That she, 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 she was so scared that I was with my mom that, and I walked to school as a first grader about four or five miles as a first grader from my mom's house, not from my grandma. My grandma would come over there and I'd see her Driving slow, watching me walk the whole way. Go, watching me go the whole way. She was keeping her eye on me. She was keeping her eye on me. See, they took me in, y'all, is what I'm saying. And she never wanted for anything. Oh, she's a beautiful woman. But listen, I, I don't mean to get sidetracked on that. Here's what I want to tell you. The greatest servant of all time stepped out of heaven, came to this earth, and willingly died for us, church. Yes. That ought to rise up in you, and want, you ought to want to serve him for the rest of your life. Amen. So I'll close with this last scripture, because there's going to be one day there's going to be a great humbling happen. It says in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, that the name of Jesus, every, somebody say every, every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. That's the folks that don't even want to. But they'll stand before a holy Jesus. And I, and I don't think, I don't see Jesus doing it out of, out of, you're going to serve me bow. And he makes their, their insides bow down. I, I, don't, I don't even see it like that. I think he'll take them through the whole thing. Take them through the whole plan and what he actually did for us and how much he loved us. And they're, they're everybody, the, the people who, who reject, they're just going to have to fall down before you. Yeah. But, see, but see, it's going to be too late for some of those. And that's what's sad. That's why... It's so beautiful, and it's so beautiful to the eyes of God where people will humble themselves and bow at the name of Jesus. We will confess him as our Lord and Savior and him not, him not having to do it for us. Amen. That we willingly want to love on our Father. We want to love on our Savior. We willingly want to do his will for our life, and I believe that just makes him smile. But guys, there's no room for pride in any of that. That relationship right there. So if you struggle with pride tonight, lay it before Jesus. Lay it before Jesus. And he knows what to do with it. He knows what to do with it. Amen? Amen.
Well, let's pray, and we will be dismissed. God, your plans are so good. Your love is so great. God, you are so good. Thank you for letting us spend some time with you today, Lord. I, I pray that we can spend a little more time later, too. Lord, thank you for how much you love us. Thank you for showing us a historical story, historical kings, but then we see our name in that story. Thank you. Your word is so relevant. It's perfect. We thank you for it, Lord. God, as we move out of here today and go on about our lives, Lord, use us. Let us be willing to share our testimony. Let us be willing to share how good you are. Let us, as hard as it is, let us be willing to consider others better than ourselves. Because, Lord, when we do that, they'll usually listen to us. And we can tell them about you. Thank you for how you love us. Thank you for this church, Lord. I pray you continue to fill these seats up, Lord, for people to hear your word. We look forward to Sunday. But Lord, let us know that Sunday is going to be awesome because we come ready to worship and we come ready and we come prepared to get into your work and the atmosphere is full of your saints who want to hear from their daddy and they want to worship their daddy Lord I think that's the difference between a good service and a great service is when people really want you. God, I pray they really, really, we all really want you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name.